What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo with Mike Golick Jr. That is me. With me, as always, super producer extraordinaire, Brandon Newman. Brandon, how we doing? Doing well, Mike. How about yourself? <sighs> Can't complain, man. Can't complain. Uh, we got a great show for everybody today here. This is a cool one uh, for me and you alike, Brandon, yes. as guys that came up when I think The Daily Show was just starting to really get to the height of its powers. John Stewart and company at the helm back then. That show most recently had Trevor Noah as the host and are now making the transition. Roy Wood Jr., who is a stand-up comedian uh, who is out and uh, doing his thing right now, has been a Daily Show correspondent since Trevor Noah came over. Those two started, had their very first day together, been one of the big voices around there, and now is going to be in the guest hosting chair uh, as they are are, you know, in the era beyond Trevor Noah and figuring out what comes next for them and is also going to be the MC for the White House Correspondents Dinner. So Ooh. cool to get to talk about him. A little bit of a departure from sports here in the midweek about his journey to The Daily Show. Again, something that was such a big part of my life growing up to watch him talk about what that show meant to him, how he came and actually auditioned for that show and didn't get the job earlier on in his career, came back the second time around and just how he thought it changed and you know what it benefited from having Trevor Noah around and now where they go from here. Really, really interesting stuff. Between him and guys like Wyatt Sinek, like all the correspondents of color over there, I've, I've always followed their stand-up career and their rise to fame and to even get in front of uh, Jon Stewart and be on The Daily Show and talk about departures, Mike. I know a lot of people are sad that it is not a Wilder Wednesday. We will push that to yes. Thursday, but I feel like Rory Woods Jr. is a perfect reason to deviate. Yes, like I say, we had some scheduling conflicts, and so Charlotte is kind enough to come hang out with us tomorrow for people that are used to Wilder Wednesday right now. Obviously, we love it too. You're still going to get it. It's just going to be on Thursday this week because we had to move some stuff around. I'm on the road. I'll raise the hand on that one, but we were lucky enough to also have Roy coming through here. That was going to be an episode shared this week anyway, and so you get it a day earlier, and it's excellent stuff there. He does mention why it Snack does come into play in a couple of these stories in a way that I think is very, very funny. So lots of great stuff uh, from him. We've also got plenty of news from more of the NFL owners meetings and some rules that were passed coming out of that that have definitely piqued some eyes among the NFL constituents. We've also got a new uh, Basketball Hall of Fame class and some record numbers from women's college basketball. But uh, Brandon, unfortunately, we have to start with a story that is devastating and sad and difficult to talk about and one that I know you and I talked a lot about after what happened the tragedy on Michigan State Michigan State's campus earlier this year we took a little while to address that we weren't really sure how to it sometimes we can all feel a little bit overwhelmed with the frequency of these incidents unfortunately yeah. and it can feel it can feel like you're not doing anything, like you're spinning your tires to talk about these things. But you and I both, uh, I think, felt like coming off then that acknowledging these things as they happen and making sure to to say their names and to talk about it and make sure that the people who are dealing with these tragedies feel seen is important. And that's unfortunately where we are at uh, with the latest school shooting in Nashville. Um, for anyone that missed it and God, it would feel hard to at this point. Um, a 28-year-old shooter killed three children and three adults at a private Christian school in Nashville uh, just this week. Like we said about the frequency, it is the 19th shooting at an American school or university in 2023 where at least one person was wounded, according to CNN tally, and the deadliest since the attack uh, at the school in Uvalde that left 21, uh, 21 dead, including a number of children. Um, in this case, the lives lost were three nine-year-old students, Evelyn Dickhouse, William Kinney, and Hallie Scruggs. Uh, also killed was uh, Cynthia Peak, who was a uh, substitute teacher, Catherine Kuntz, the 60-year-old head of the school, and Mike Hill, who was a 61-year-old custodian there. And... It, Brandon, we've talked about it. All of these are devastating, but when you see nine years old, when you see kids, um, 
there's just something about it as I sit out here and I'm fortunate to get to hang out with my nine month year old, my nine month old nephew, Jackson, as you've got two kids at home to just think about that reality. Every time this happens, I think about you. I think about my brother and his wife. I think about all our friends that are parents and just how terrifying it has to be right now to send your kids out into the world where there is so much that can happen and we see happen over and over and over again in a way that feels completely out of control. And to the point about it feeling numbing after a while where we all sometimes pull back a little bit because it's the only way we can get through the day because this happens so often. I think the thing I keep going back to is if we don't continue to love and pick each other up, it, it it only gets harder. There's already so much darkness around this, and and so much of that is going to fall on the people around that community, the people that know these people that have dealt with tragedy to work in that immediate sphere. But for all the rest of us to just say we love you because that's all we can do. We've been you know outside of pushing for reform, things that feel like they're just never going to fucking happen in a way that's maddening and infuriating and, and all of these terrible things. But uh, on a basic level, as we sit here, it's just to remind each other that if none of the rest of these people that can make decisions care, the rest of us at least care enough to, to love people harder and to make sure we look out for each other as best we can, because the people that are supposed to be in charge of taking care of us don't seem to always do uh, the job that they're supposed to. Well, also in the society, the people that are supposed to be protected are not. Yeah. Uh, the people that are supposed to be protected by community are targeted. And and that's why I feel scary, not only for our children, Mike, but for us as well. It's just, um, it's dangerous to be in the society right now. And, and that's terrible to say. And I don't think that's hyperbole or, or dramatic to say when we're talking about the 19th school shooting of this calendar year as we sit here in March. Uh, I just, you know, I obviously we do the thoughts and prayers thing, but like our our hearts are in our energy and our 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 thoughts and our all of it, all of it is with this community. All of it is with Nashville. All of it is with the the Midwest right now. Um, and and I it feels like the only thing that takes our pain away or numbs it from this incident is, is another incident, Mike, and it, there's no healing. No, no, and, and God, you know, you 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 see so many people who, who get angry and continue to keep that passion up, and, it, and it's admirable to continue to fight for something that's going to change this, some bit of reform, some little bit of gun legislation, some bit of the any things that we've cried out over and over and over again and seen in this case and in many others, children slaughtered over and over and over again and nothing happens. It can feel maddening. It does make you thankful in this case specifically for the officers and the first responders that were on duty here. Uh, we saw there was body camera footage from officers Rex Engelbert and Michael Colazzo who fatally shot the attacker on Monday and from the time that the 911 call was made until that shooter was taken out was about 14 minutes. And so as so much of that was discussed post Uvalde, to see that response time to prevent even further tragedy does make you thankful for the people who stepped up in that moment to to stop what was happening as quickly as they could. And so uh, again, man, just uh, it's the unfortunately a refrain we've had to say far too often. But hold your people tight, lift everyone else, lift everyone up in your circle, and take care of each other uh, until the time where we can get the people in charge to take care of the rest of us in the way that needs to happen. Um, you know, it's the the no easy transition line, Brandon. This stuff sucks. I, I actually. In talking to Roy in the interview you're going to hear, we taped this earlier, he references how this is part of the job of The Daily Show, actually, and something for years that I've watched them do, but talks specifically about this instance, about how you go about trying to put this news in front of people in a way that's going to make them think, which I'm certainly not the one capable of doing but also in a way where they do try and find a way to make people laugh in dark times, which is an almost impossible task and one that makes me thankful for immensely talented people like Roy and the ones he works with who are able to try and do that. We will try and do it in our own way with talking sports on the rest of this podcast, with the rest of the interview that we've got with Roy. And so, Brandon, why don't we try and do that here? We've got NFL owners meetings 
uh, going on still right now out here in Phoenix. And while the Lamar Jackson fervor has died down a little bit, we did get some comments from uh, Atlanta Falcons owner Arthur Blank, who cited the differences between Lamar Jackson and Deshaun mm. Watson. He told a group of reporters that Lamar Jackson's situation is, quote, very different than Deshaun Watson from a year ago. Blank did mention that there's some concern with Lamar's style and how long it could hold up. He brought up the games he's missed over the last two years, saying, quote, each game counts in this business. Now, Brandon, ignoring like the easiest low-hanging fruit there of Deshaun Watson and the crimes that he was alleged to have been involved in, the ones that the NFL's investigation Ooh. says that he was guilty of. Aside from all of that, Deshaun Watson is also a player that missed a number of games at the end of the 2017 season with a non-contact ACL injury suffered in practice and then missed 11 games this year as a part of a suspension. All of those games apparently did not matter enough to the Cleveland Browns as they signed him on there. I understand this is projecting this out over the longer term, and you make these decisions around quarterbacks to try and secure your franchise for a number of years to come. But man, it gets maddening to hear anyone say anything other than, man, we just really don't want to fully guarantee all this money. Like just, it would be so right. much less infantilizing if that was just the sentence that came out of someone's mouth, but they know they can't say that because then all the collusion conversation starts again. And so here we are. The collusion conversations get validated because that's exactly what it is. It's, it's getting creative to get your message across, regardless of how false that message is. Like, you don't like the guy. You're, you're, wor you're worried about who will like the guy. You're worried that somebody's going to like the guy too much and pay him. I guess that's what the Baltimore Ravens were worried about. But I think for all the wrong, all the opposite reasons, Mike, I do feel like the Ravens understand Lamar Jackson's value. But the reason why they're capping at a specific point is I don't even think it's the injuries as much as it is the Deshaun Watson deal was bad, and we can and we. And the NFL and the owners have decided that that cannot be the model moving forward, regardless of the talent. It's one of those things that for as much as some organizations are looked at as the model organizations are looked at in a certain way, all these owners are the same. Like they're all after the same thing. They're all trying to maximize their profit. Some care a little bit more about winning and are willing to spend more on that than the others. But they're all afraid of players gaining leverage in any form or fashion. It comes up mm. every time something's getting collectively bargained. It comes up every time that there's CBA and labor issues. And it's coming up in this case because that's exactly what it is. Ozzie Newsom said the quiet part loud the other week when he said, we're trying to figure out if that Deshaun Watson deal was an outlier or a trend and where we fit into that. And that tells you everything you need to know about the situation. That's the most honest thing we've heard about this entire process. So you had more of that leaking out. Obviously, I will continue to sit here and hope and wait for the Indianapolis Colts to deliver us from evil and do something crazy and spice this whole thing up. In the meantime, though, Brandon, we did have actual things passed. As part of this, as always, the NFL owners getting together and voting on a number of different measures, potential rule changes. I got to, spoiler alert for anyone who's going to be listening to Golik and Smetty today. Also, I went on with my dad and Jessica Smetana, and my dad was very angry that the NFL owners voted to not make uh, roughing the passer a reviewable penalty. Brandon, I'm sure for you as a former D lineman, also equally pissed about that. Collusion. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> Simple as that, Mike. They want to keep us down. I saw a TikTok the other day of like the most ranking the most difficult positions to play, and rightfully so. Defensive tackles was like one of the lowest, or, which equals one of the easiest positions to play. But with that, Mike, give us a little break. Give us some leeway here. We're trying to get to the passer. I mean, Brandon. Speaking of that, like the attacks on defensive linemen. Did you see, uh, I think it was Tom Pelissaro of the NFL Network reported that the rule proposal allowing players to wear the number zero except for offensive and defensive linemen passed today. So even kickers and punters can wear zero. I saw a number of players already announced. Micah Parsons said he wants to wear zero for the Cowboys, even though, remember, to change your jersey, you got to cut a fat check to the NFL because of 
all the jerseys they're already selling. Debo Samuel said, I want to wear one, but I'm not about to come up off all that bread for the NFL to do so. Micah Parsons has made that change already, a number of other players, but the hating ass NFL won't let D Lyman go out there and be great. They, they won't, Mike, but all I can think of is Micah Parsons, who is a D lineman when he wants to be every now and then, paying a lot of money for those 11 jerseys. Like He's got to pay a lot of money if he wants to change that number. Big, big lot of money. That being said, he is someone who is going to recoup a lot of that money later on down the True. line. But I always say, keep as much as you can along the way, and maybe just wait till next year to get that change when you got a little more time and leeway. But I still think that is a crime against humanity. I think that defensive tackles should be the only people allowed to wear the number zero. I think it is the, by far the best look. We talked about this the other day. And so seeing the NFL's clear bias against large excellence being codified today is shameful. The NFL Gross. should be ashamed of themselves, and they're a league that's afraid to let big people be great. It's sad. It's sad. As Justin Tuck told us a long time ago, sacks get stacks, and um, they're trying to hold. They're trying to hold my people down, Mike. They're trying to hold my people down. <sighs> Hate ass league, man. Hate ass league. And I'd say the biggest rule change that came up today that actually weighed on the mind of players was the NFL opting to vote on a rule change that would allow clubs to play multiple Thursday night games during the course of a season. Uh, now, the bigger story ended up being what they did not vote on, or they voted down, which was a rule that would allow games to be flexed into Thursday night. But clubs agreed to modify the existing rule. It used to be teams could only play one Thursday night football game a season, and now teams can play a maximum of two short week games. That's cleverly phrased because if you were to play Thursday before or after Thanksgiving... You could technically be on the hook for a third Thursday game because you get a week time in between that Thursday to that Thursday. And so, as we saw, Patrick Mahomes, one of the faces of the league, quote, tweet this with the palm face emoji. Players are all looking at this going, okay, so we just want to make sure we can give Papa Bezos the best thing possible. That That's how we're living right now. Oh, Thursday equals prime games. I almost forgot. Yeah, and I can, I like... Roger Goodell came out and did what he is paid handsomely by the NFL owners to do and ran cover for this, said, we have got the numbers to show that the injury is not as big an uptick as people are mentioning right now. Um, he said, you know, Roger Goodell was asked about the Mahomes tweet and said, quote, I don't think we're putting Amazon over player interest. We look at data with respect to injuries and impact on players. I think we have data that's very clear. It doesn't show higher injury rate. He also added, I hear a lot of play from players directly too. They have 10 days afterward. So there's some benefits to that side. Now, mm. I've heard from my dad for years who played for the Philadelphia Eagles, who played a lot of those Thanksgiving games against a team like the Cowboys, that he always looked at it and said, hey, we were playing all one Thursday game a year, and we were fine, that old party line. Now everyone's been playing, and we've heard a lot of NFL players as vocal critics of this. One, if you're the NFL, you can't just say you've got the data. you got to show us the data. And if it's out Ooh. there and I missed it, then that's on me. But if not, the NFL needs to put those numbers out readily, saying this is what we have about the instance or uptick of injuries on Thursday night football, flat out. The bottom yeah. line is, though, there's not much they can do as far as telling about there can't be a whole lot of catalog data about the effect of two Thursday night games on a player's body over the course of the year. The effect of two right. Thursday night games along with an extended and expanded NFL season and an expanded NFL playoff. You see what I'm saying? Like At some point, it's just basic knowledge. If you keep adding more games, there are tons more chances for guys to get hurt in this violent collision sport. And for all of those things to happen, and listen, for them to be able to do this, this is power that has been collectively bargained for them. But when you even have owners complaining for very different reasons, right? Like when you have John Mara, the owner of the New York Giants, coming out opposed to the flex two Thursday night games, this idea that with 15 days notice, you can take a team that was playing on Sunday and say, hey, you're playing on Thursday now because you're doing really good. We want to make sure we get good games on Thursdays. He called that abusive to fans which I thought was hilarious. Now, it's not wrong, he said at some point, people make plans to go to these games weeks and months in advance, and all of a sudden, two weeks out, to say, sorry folks, the game you were planning on taking your kids to Sunday at one is on a Thursday. But the idea that he called it abusive to fans 
is sort of hilarious here as it's also a nod for the NFL. We're clearly thinking about the TV audience a lot more than we're thinking about the in-person ah, audience. True. It's a, it's a gift for one audience and a curse for the other one. Cause yeah, as someone with kids, a Thursday night game is much different than a Sunday afternoon game. I mean, and just think about the planning for that. Like, I see all the time how much effort it takes just to get kids down to the beach when you live in Los Angeles, let alone to an NFL stadium with all the shit you need to keep a kid busy. Yeah, no, it's 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 a it's a non fact. I but it we come back to the changing the narrative just to fit your agenda because you can always say the thing that's going to make people raise their eyebrows, like, oh, he's got a point here. It's like that doesn't mean it should be changed. No, exactly. And I think that was it. So it was interesting to watch the pushback from owners like Art Rooney, who also came out and said he didn't support the flex. And I thought this was telling um, from John Mara, who said, and I want to try and find the quote here. He said, this should have been vetted by the health and safety committee. It should have been vetted by the competition committee, and it was not. They just tried to push it through. He was frustrated that this had no advance warning coming up to this week. And like with most things in life, when you're trying to do something you know is kind of slick, you yeah. usually try and do it on the low like this. You usually try and do it without a lot of advance warning. You're not trying to have a ton of extended conversation about it because you know it's something that's probably not going to go over well. So surprise, surprise, some people called it out when it was going to mess up their money for some of that in-stadium ticket revenue. But everyone else is looking at this like, yet, like no, we see this coming too. We hadn't heard heads or tails about the idea of multiple Thursday night games much in the months leading up to this. And now all of a sudden it's here saying, hey, it's me. I'm the problem. It's me. <laughs> the thought of uh, people, well, I don't even know. Is it, is it the NFL commissioners? Like Roger Goodell having a certain list of rule changes that the coaches have no idea about, the owners have no idea about. And he's like, hey, well, it's, it's on the docket. Are you, vote. It's time. Well, and this thing is some owners don't know. Like, I can't imagine. Like, Roger mm. Goodell doesn't come up with this stuff. Like, we know that there's a group of owners amongst all the rest of the owners that tend to have more of the power amongst how these things are done and moved about in the league. So it didn't just come from nowhere, right? Oh, what if it came from Jeff Bezos, as you call him? Uh, they, they, <laughs> Dan Snyder said, nope, not selling the team to him. And he came back to Roger Goodell's like, okay, how, you, how am I going to make my money now? What y'all going to do? You know, again, it's just one of those things, though. Roger Goodell works for the owners. And so while that's a television partner, like that. Roger's, Roger's not negotiating and doing this stuff on his own. Like, I hear Dominique Foxworth talk all the time about his experience being in negotiating rooms for the CBA sitting across the desk from Jerry Jones. Like, more often than not, that's who I think of when it comes to this stuff is most shit's not getting signed off around the league unless Jerry says so. That's kind of the world mm. we live in right now. So I don't know that for a fact. Obviously, that is just, you know, me hey. thinking out loud here, but. He is in the Hall of Fame. There is no lie. There is no lie. Um, and listen, I, I understand, and I always hear my dad's argument. I, I dare to that, right? Because I didn't play in the NFL. I didn't experience these Thursday night games. I know the physical toll a football game takes on you, and even as a young person in college, what it's like trying to turn your body around for that next week, how the recovery starts the next day if you're smart. And for a lot of these NFL guys, as you get older, it starts the hours after the game. We see that more and more now, that recovery is a full-time job for this guy. And so I hear our Rooney the second saying you can give them back to back Thursday nights and have a buy on the third end of things or try and do clever scheduling tactics to get people out of it but at some point it's just the sheer volume of things you keep adding and we know part of the negotiation for expanding the NFL season was to also put more money in the pocket of players and that's always a decision players have to make at the negotiating table is is the added strain on our bodies year in and year out worth the extra percentage we're going to be taking home overall as a result of what's given up at the negotiation table it just seems like there's so much change we've seen in the last couple of years that just keeps adding more and more to the pile so I would love to see those numbers about injury I would love to see if those have been made readily available to people as far as how they go about justifying adding multiple Thursday night football games for teams as a possibility for the seasons going forward. So we'll wait and see as more and more continues to come out of these meetings. We're going to take a quick break though. And when we come back, we are going to talk to our friend daily show correspondent, Roy Wood Jr.
All right, excited to welcome to the podcast Roy Wood Jr. You guys have seen him as Daily Show correspondent. He's out on the road, uh, Tribulations, the stand-up tour he's out on the road with right yeah. now. And uh, getting ready to also MC the White House Correspondence Dinner. It's the same you're not doing shit right now, Roy. Well, you know, we're trying to do some stuff, man. So, you know, we got the Tribulations, which is like a live comedy group therapy show thing we're doing in New York. It's also a live stream as well. So if people want to go to my website and jump on the live, get a ticket to watch that live on a Monday night in April, they can. Um, the Correspondence Dinner, I guess, will also be technically live streamed on C-SPAN. I believe... Most of my own shows will have a higher view count than C-SPAN.com. No disrespect to C-SPAN.com. I love you. Please cut the check. That's all you need, man. Just make sure that check clears and everything else is good <laughs> from there. But no, it's it, it's exciting. I mean, listen, I, I, I got to talk to you a bunch back in the ESPN days, but seeing this point you're at now here, what's this been like, this transition? I mean... You came over to The Daily Show with Trevor all the way the years back when, and you guys started around the same time. Yeah. What's it been like seeing the show go through this sort of transition? It's it's weird. I'll be honest. I'll be honest. You know, to start the same night as Trevor seven years ago and to see Trevor leave and to see what they're doing now with the guest hosts, and ratings have been great, and the guest hosts have been fun, but as a correspondent to be one of the one constants within the building – like it's like having a different it's like having a like and I don't even want to say substitute teacher because that's demeaning to the caliber of the guest host that we've had. But it's like a different quarterback. Imagine if your team started a different quarterback every week and it's like, OK, well, what offense are we going to run this week? And it's exciting and horrifying all at the same time somehow. Uh, but, you know, it's been it's been net positive, you know, in terms of just being able as a correspondent to still get out there and talk about whatever the hell is wrong in this country. That part of the job has not changed. I think those things are the core tenements of the daily show. Like that's its base level DNA. So regardless of who's in the chair week to week as a correspondent, my job hasn't changed that much. So I'm thankful for that. But, you know, it's, I will say that it has been interesting in that Trevor came in and then immediately we had, you know, the rise yeah. of Trump that following year. You know, we we started September of 2015 and the Republican primaries were that following summer. Thankfully, this year, it's kind of a between year for elections. And then next year in 2024 is when things really will start get cooking and moving, you know, going into election season. So, you know, that part of it, I'm, you know, I'm thankful that we're able to be in this transitional period during a time where it's not as much political calamity. Well, there's calamity, but there's not election year. Calamity. Yeah, I was going to say, there's never shortage yes. of calamity in this country, unfortunately. So you guys have uh, a yeah. never-ending supply of source material, even if it's not always in the ways that we'd like. Mm -hmm. has, yeah, it's it's definitely a weird, weird time. Has uh, And now you're getting to guest host now. You're going to have the role reversal and be in the chair coming up here pretty soon. Has what you just yeah. described kind of informed how you want to go about that as a guest host, knowing what it's been like for you on the other side? I think with, if you look at all of the guest hosts, the one thing we've been able to balance with every guest host is it, like, with, like the Daily Show based tenement, right? It's here's what everybody's talking here's jokes about what everybody's talking about and here's the things you should be talking about or you should be considering here's the conversations that you probably aren't having that you should so figuring out the balance of those two topics you know has been the cool thing you know i'm a graduate of florida a m university which is a historically black college in florida and if you see what's happening and everything that desantis is saying about blackness and history and education and da -da 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 -da, that's on my radar of, of stuff to talk about uh, during my week. My week is uh, April 3rd. I start on April 3rd. So it's it's going to be fun. But, you know, to have a week in the chair, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. It's not something I take lightly. And, you know, it is an honor to be able to be entrusted for a week in ushering the national conversation on whatever the hell is going on that week. I, I think I've seen you say this elsewhere, so I don't think I'm putting words in your mouth here. This is a job you'd like full time, yeah? If they offer me that job, I'd take that job immediately. I wouldn't even counter. 
Wow. If they said five dollars, I'd be like, "Well, not five dollars." <laughs> I know Chris McCarthy probably gonna hit us, but, uh, but yeah, it's to be a person where I've come from, and to have an opportunity to be in a chair, one, what I consider to be one of the most important chairs in late night television, and have an opportunity to shine lights on everything that's going on in the world. You can't run from that opportunity. You can't run from that call. And that's some Neo Matrix follow the white rabbit. Whether you think you're ready or not, you got to go. You have to try this. You have to attempt this. And, you know, considering my background in stand up comedy, my degree in broadcast journalism, this job is literally the perfect marriage <laughs> of those two things. So I kind of, I got to give it a shot, right? No, I, I I absolutely think so, and, and I I don't know what the way you've talked about it too is heartening because that's the way as someone who you know my formative years when John was in the chair that was exactly what the Daily Show was it was this thing that was kind of there to shepherd not only through the moments everyone was talking about but lead that in a way I always say and going back to you know the response to nine eleven John Stewart is the voice ingrained in my head in his response to that moment and how he chose to lead the audience at that point. I'm curious for you, like what was your first exposure to the daily show? When did this start to be something that was on your radar that you wanted to be a part of and you saw as valuable? Um, I first auditioned for the show in 2007, so we can start there, but working backwards from that point, you know, when John and Steven, there was, there was an episode of the daily show where Steve Carell ate a scoop of Crisco on camera. And I don't know if you ever touched Crisco or seen Crisco, but the man ate, and it was to prove a point about education or some uh, trans fat joke. I, I don't remember what it was, Olestra and all of that. And, and my man ate a spoonful of Crisco, then swallowed it, dog. And, and I'm like, you just ate Crisco on television. I need to work there. This looks like chaos, <laughs> but it also looks fun. Because you also have to remember, bro, like my my interest in my interest in in journalism was also about infusing humor into it. You know, my father was a civil rights journalist. Nothing he covered had a punchline. It was all serious business. The man got shot at in Vietnam and Soweto and Zimbabwe and Mozambique. Like he, my daddy stayed getting shot at and beat on for the sake of truth. And I looked at him and I was like, not going to do it that way. <laughs> so, you know, as much as I love my father, a lot of my interest in journalism came down to Kenny Maine, Stuart Scott, Jenny Moose, most on uh, CNN and Van Earl Wright who at the time was at CNN headline news and they were all funny in a way and fun in how they covered their stories. So that's kind of what I wanted to do. And when the daily show came along and I just started, I just, that's where I got my news because it was fun and light. It didn't feel like a pressure cooker, <laughs> you know, like I was just getting preached at. So that's kind of where, that's where it all started. I auditioned in 2007. And when I tell you I botched that audition, the fact that I even got a second chance to audition for this show is wild. It's wild. Like, like I, I blew the audition. The audition was so bad. The person who went in after me destroys. And they're all laughing and jovial after that person left. And I realized I left my keys in the room. So I had to go back in the room I just bombed in oh. to get my car keys. And when I came back in the room, all the laughter stopped. I was like, oh shit, I didn't get the job. I definitely didn't get this job. Oh no. Oh dear. <laughs> oh man. Uh, so, so when did you know in the second audition then that it was going like, was it almost immediately that you knew, oh, this time around is a lot better? I didn't care. You know, there's something that they say about you have to leave it all in the room. And if you know you did your best, sink or swim, what decisions are made after that are not in your control, which, to be honest, is a lot of how I feel about now about hosting the show. It's not my decision. My job is to be amazing, which I will be. And then 
either I dance with Comedy Central or I dance somewhere else and I will be amazing wherever else I land. And that's fine. It's about finding the right partners. Um, I came into the audition. I remember what the audition was. Um, there was a kid at the time when I auditioned for The Daily Show. This is summer 2015. So we're big on Confederate monuments. We're big on anti-Confederate flag rhetoric and a national conversation, right? And there was a black kid in West Virginia who had a Confederate flag stat, uh, tattoo on his arm. And I just remember doing a check. Like you have to write a segment. I wrote a segment with Trevor just saying, but the basic gist of it was that I understand why a black person in West Virginia has a Confederate flag tattoo. That's for survival. That is the ultimate don't harass me card. If you're ever getting pulled over, if you're getting chased through the wood, you just pull up your sleeve and show that tag. <laughs> and the whole angle of it was me defending reasons why a black person would get a Confederate flag tattoo. And when you look at my standup, a lot of it is just, I'm trying to find the weird argument that nobody else has made yet. So I do that chat with Trevor, it gets a laugh. And then I roll up my sleeve to reveal a temporary Confederate flag tat that I'd gotten the night before basically saying we have to go rescue this guy and i got my camouflage let's go get him whatever and they were laughing as hard at me that day as the laughs i heard coming through the wall in 2007 because the person in 2007 that was getting those laughs was wyatt Sinek, mm. who ended up you know winning numerous emmys yeah. with the show so I felt the same energy that I walked into when I went to get my car keys. I was like, ah, oh, all right. Well, if I don't get it, it's not my fault. I did everything I was supposed to do. See you later. Got a call on the way to the airport that I'd booked the gig. Wow. You are uh, in there. You mentioned that like freeing feeling of saying, hey, I'm going to go in there and just leave it all out. Was there a point along the way where that yep. clicked you, for you, like confidence-wise, where you got to that place where you were more comfortable saying, this is just about me and not worrying about the outcome? Because I feel like that's a mature way to look at things that not everybody can embrace right away when they get started doing stuff like this. Yeah, I, I think it's a difficult place to – it's a difficult place to land – early on because you're forcing yourself to trust yourself and nine times out of 10, we're being, we're forcing ourselves to trust ourselves with something that we've never done before or a journey we've never gone on before, but you just have to respect the fact that your instincts got you everywhere you are now. At some point you have to trust yourself to get to second base. So trust that you still have those same instincts and rely on those to get you to third base and to get you home. Did you remember the point where you started to trust yourself more like that? Oh, uh, early on in stand up comedy, I'd say the first big leap of faith I made in my career was I stopped working with a comedy club booker who I, I just didn't like the way they were treating me, I didn't like the way they were. The way they ran their business was not something that made me feel good. So I stopped calling them for work. This booker at the time was about 70% of my income. Mm. So to make that choice is a little fiscally suicidal, but I just felt like I would be better off not working with them and it would force me to find other things and other places to go and other stuff to do. And, you know, that part of that period in my life was very scary. And then, you know, a couple of months later, I was, you know, thankfully blessed enough to book a couple of colleges, which made up for every dime that I lost from that person. A lot of our career, in my opinion, you're running in fog. But, you know, they say you can't get on second base with your foot on first. I believe that wholeheartedly. And I really do feel like there has to be. You have to you have to jump. You have to jump sometimes. 
and you might fall, but even in that fall, you're going to learn something. And for me, that was the first time where I went, okay, if I look and I really lay out my fiscal plans and what I want to do and what my approach is going to be, and it works, then I can trust that the thoughts I have after that for, you know, for similar scenarios will be, um, will be the same thoughts I have to trust. Like when I look at right now, I'm not really in a different position now than I was in 2006 when that happened. You know, the idea of moving to Los Angeles and cutting off 70% of my income while going to another market didn't seem right. But I have a plan. This plan should work. And for the most part, the plan worked because it was well thought out. It was laid out. When you look at everything that's happening right now with late night, late night isn't a full turnover, bro. Like James Corden is gone. Like they're replacing it with at midnight. They're cutting budgets. They're canceling TV shows. They're canceling movies they've already shot. Mm. There's no telling what the industry is going to be by this fall. And there's a writer's strike on the horizon. And somewhere in the midst of all of that, I work on a late night show that hasn't decided who's going to be the host yet. So this is very unsettled sands, but I've been here before and I have a plan and I know I have talent and I know I have drive. And if you have those things, you will land somewhere. And if you don't have those things, surround yourself with people who do so that they can lift you up in the times where you can't lift yourself. I think having a good network is important, bro. It's like the geese, right? It's like when geese, like, you know, how the geese fly in that formation mm-hmm. and they take turns running lead in that little triangle formation because the, 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 the goose in the front is working the hardest and everybody else is drafting off of the next goose. And, and so that's what we need from time to time. And your network has to be that sometimes you're in front and you're running charge and your partners are with you. And then other times you're tired, you're emotionally exhausted and you got to play the background a little bit, but you still have a pack that you're running with. And I think that part of it has been very integral, you know, for me as well. You know, it's not so much about always being able to believe in yourself, but seeing other people believe in themselves could help you too. Is that, would that be an accurate description of what the environment around the daily show was like for you? Was that what it was like with that group of creators in there where you were in a spot to lift each other up or to be able to, you know, watch and appreciate someone else sort of having their moment in front? Yeah. I mean, look at my resume. I've never worked anywhere like this place before this, you know, the only thing close that comes close um, I was three years on a multi-camera sitcom on TBS, Sullivan and Son, which, you know, a multi-camera sitcom is not the same as a daily 11 p.m. comedy show. It's just not. And so the stakes are the stakes are much higher at the daily show because we're talking about stuff that people are emotionally invested in. By and large, most scripted sitcoms are for emotional escapism, to give you a release, to give you something to forget about what's going on. The job of The Daily Show is to remind you about what's going on, tell you about all the other horrific stuff that you didn't know was going on, but that's going on, and then send you to bed calmly at 1130. (laughs) So, you know, we have to find this horrible shit that's going on in the world and then figure out a way to make it funny. And we only have a few hours to do it because rehearsal's coming up like a freight train. So, yeah, there's days where you can't find the funny because you're angry or because you're sad or because you're just emotionally spent from something that you had to cover the day before. But we have a team. We have a whole squad of people that are all in different periods of that emotional life cycle of what news can sometimes do to your psyche. And. Sure enough, every day there's a different goose leading the formation, you know, and so that that part of it is very important. And you learn a lot from that. You know, Trevor Noah, if nothing else, has left a legacy of people in this building maintaining a calmer temperament about the incredulous things that we might see, because the thing that also sucks is that if you're too angry, sometimes 
there's no room for laughs. And at the end of the day, our job is still to make you laugh. We are a comedy program. It can be informative and enlightening a lot of the time, but at the core, the objective is set up punchline. You mentioned Trevor's role in all this. You guys started on the same day back years ago now. What do you think of when you hear the name Trevor Noah at this point? Like, what does he mean to you now? Uh, You know, Trevor Noah gave me an opportunity to do something that, you know, he gave me an opportunity to be able to prove, you know, everything that I'm capable of doing as an entertainer and as a journalist. So I'm forever thankful to the man for that opportunity because it's one that he did not have to give. It's one that I had already squandered eight years prior, (laughs) you know, so to have had almost a decade of experience under my belt doing other things and having my stand up develop and my worldview develop and to be able to come back and do that again is great. You know, I was just in conversation with him uh, at a university. We did uh, like a live Q and a chat thing out in long Island. And it was my first time seeing him since he left in December. And I also see this look of just joy and relaxation in his face. Go on Trevor's Instagram and look at a picture now versus a picture from two years ago. The boy was, it's a lot heavy as the head. And my man took that crown off and that head light as hell now. He chilling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cornrows and white water rafting. You never saw <laughs> Trevor with cornrows <laughs> during the Daily Show. You never. The, the research team would have been like, yeah, ad sales doesn't like the cornrows. Can you pick up my... <laughs> oh, so so he's he's yeah. just lighter now. Like, there really is so much that goes with being, you know, for lack of a better term, to go with the analogy, the head goose for that long. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And I think, you know, and you can see that to a degree with Jon Stewart as well, you know. If you look at John and the time he took away from just polit- politics in general after he left The Daily Show, and now he's rejuvenated and he's coming back and whooping ass over there on Apple Plus. So I think that you need these breathers from time to time when you're doing this type of work. Because to, to find jokes, first off, you have to take in all of the bad news. And then decide of the bad news, what's the most relevant and what can you make funny? How can you figure out? the? And I think the thing that we that I feel like we identify best under Trevor was to a degree. In this country, we're not always ready to laugh at tragedy. We're just not we're not wired like that anymore as a country because there's too many different divisive issues. There's too many things that I think touch a nerve with all of us, be it women's rights or police reform or gun control, whatever, whatever tragedy you want to connect to a national issue, there are groups of people that are not ready to laugh at that. But what you can do as a show is find jokes that lie within the causation of the tragedy or jokes that lie in what is the solution to this. And then you're able to live adjacent to the issue without talking specifically about the issue. If we want, like if we want to use Nashville for an example in the tragedy uh, that happened in Nashville recently uh, with the school shooting, we would never talk about that. But what we could talk about is Tennessee's gun control laws and the causation and who's and what's happening in Tennessee around that issue. And really, if we're slick about it, we never have to mention Nashville at all. It's already implied and understood because that part of it is already within our subconscious. So it's just about figuring out the tactful ways to talk about these issues in a way that's not as emotionally taxing on the viewer or the people that have to that are shouldered with creating it. You mentioned taking a breather. Do you have a spot or do you have a a thing that you do when you kind of need to step back from all of this? There's a, this is going to sound silly, but there's a batting cage on the West side highway (laughs) that, that I go to. Like, that's my, that's my frustration release spot. Um, But, you know, as a correspondent, it's a little different in that 
I get a few more breathers than the host would have because I'm not on every single day. And if I'm not on the show, I'm usually in the edit with my with one of my field directors figuring out what to do about this piece and how to move this segment around, you know, just a little knickknack stuff. So we're not necessarily always in it, but you know, for me, jigsaw puzzles, I enjoy Sudoku, uh, Wordle from mm. time to time. I hate to say it, but I like Wordle. You're the one still keeping I'm them afloat here. Good this is good it. to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Okay. So you've got yeah. those things off to the side of people. The batting cage is a great one there. I didn't, it's almost like a version of those um, those stress rooms where you just get to go beat random stuff with a baseball bat here. You just actually challenge Literally. the game nation port of it. Yeah. I, the only thing I don't like about batting cages is that there's people waiting who are like actually taking this serious and like trying to get better to have a professional career. And I'm just in here goofing off, bro. Like I'm not trying to. So that part of it I don't like. I don't like being stared at by 15 year olds who are getting recruited by major league teams already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm in the 60 mile an hour cage and I'm whiffing. Shut up. <laughs> Let me live. Damn it. Bastard. Yeah. Kids. I'm not taking real hacks. Uh, I got this VR headset. That's got that batting, um, that batting practice app on it. Um, what's the name? Win reality. I got that win reality, major league pitching where I can see, like you can literally put on a headset and if you want to see what a Shohei Otani slider looks like at 98 miles an hour off the plate. Yeah, I need to stick with comedy. That's what I've learned <laughs> from that headset is <laughs> that I had never had a chance. Yeah, I could start my swing before he throws the ball and I'll still miss. <laughs> VR, powerful teaching tool, a lesson for everybody yeah. out there who's trying to find yeah. their way. Um, in the middle of all this transition, you also have the White House Correspondents Dinner coming up here. What's the plan of attack for that? Is this like where you got to walk in and just punch the biggest guy in the yard in the face immediately? Or what do you do for this? Yeah, I think so. I think you do. Um, I think you got to punch the Democrats too, though. I don't think you can come in and just punch Republicans. I don't think that's fair. I think that if we're talking about government and a comedic critique of the state of government, I think that we have to be balanced in that. I, the way I the way I feel about the correspondence dinner is that I feel like it is the closest thing to a citizen's rebuttal of the state of the union address. Like if the president is given the state of the union, then I believe whoever emcees the correspondence dinner is kind of given a state of the country or the state of the constituents address. Damn. I am the closest that most people will get to be in a room with their elected officials and say exactly what they want it to say. So I have to figure out a little bit of what the people are saying and what the people think and put that into joke form and then get to swinging. And, you know, it is a tightrope because I'm not trying to go in, you know, me personally, I'm not trying to go in and insult and then attack everybody. I believe a lot of what politics is, it's just money influenced and popularity influence. Uh, like, I believe half the politicians that vote for the stuff that they vote for don't even believe it. They're just so desperate to be liked and adored by somebody that they'll lie. They'll lie in order to do that, you know, and then within that. I think there's also there also has to be a conversation about just the media as a whole. You know, everybody attacks the media and to a degree that's fair. But I think we also have to look at how corporate entities and taking money away from media has really changed how news is covered and thusly how politics is covered. More importantly, how local politics is covered. Half these states don't even have a printed newspaper anymore. And the ones that do, they only print it two, three days a week. That ain't a newspaper. That's a that's a pamphlet. That's a news. That's an update. <laughs> Hell, Delta's in-flight magazine prints more. <laughs> Sky Mall <laughs> has more readers than, than most publications. And Sky Mall went out of print, what, three during the pandemic or right. something? I don't remember. 
Yeah, no sky. They still don't miss that sky mall. It's an amazing. Uh, it's an amazing bit of dedication. So you're you're absolutely yeah. right. It is a fine line to walk there. Do you have the number one thing that you want to get across there? Do you know that yet? What you want to get across personally no. outside of what just the people want? No, we're still a month out. So I'm still, I'm playing around with some themes with my writers and stuff like that. You know, I, I definitely think that there's some conversations to be had about the stability or instability of social security, uh, the debt ceiling, but it's hard because we could write jokes now about stuff that might not even be relevant by the time we get to the correspondence dinner. Like if you'd have asked me a month ago when they announced me as host, and you'd have asked me what I was talking about. I'd have told you Chinese balloons and chemical train crashes. We're not even discussing that right now. We should, but we're not. But, oh, we're not because the local reporter there got fired three years ago as part of a downsizing. So it's it's those things that we have to start kind of, you know, connecting and putting together. So that's that's what I'm working on. Well, I'm looking forward to it, man. I'm looking forward to watching your week in the chair on The Daily Show. I know you're going to just leave it all out there and let it be what it is, but we may just start the unofficial Roy Wood for uh, The Daily Show campaign here on your behalf and just start to push that agenda oh, towards the do. public as best we can. Please do. Please do. Start it up, man. Uh, but yeah, thank you a lot, man. Thank you so much um, for everything you've ever done for me. I appreciate you. And when you get out to New York, man, sooner or later, we'll get you on one of these tribulation shows, man. There we go. We'd love to make it happen. Absolutely. Uh, the great Roy Wood Jr. Guys, check out uh, Tribulations. You can check that out on his website. Going to be up on The Daily Show the week of April 3rd in the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Can't thank you enough, man. Appreciate it. Will do. Thank you, brother. Brandon, as the wise man once said, do you know what time it is? <laughs> I do, Mike. You know, man. just try my hand at something. Yeah, I'm going to take my horse to the old town road. I'm going to ride till I can't no more. I'm going to take my horse to the old town road. I'm going to till I can't no more. I got the horses in the back. Horses that, that had his matted bag. Got the boots as black to mask. Riding on a horse. You can whip your Porsche. I've been in that valley. You can get up off the porch. Now, this, that, and the third. 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 It's so amazing to think back on this sound song now, seeing what Lil Nas X has done with his career since. Like, that dude busts onto the scene and just decided to make a country song for shits and did it. <laughs> He hit him with the okie doke. Talking about, <laughs> talking about, talking about uh, saving the part that uh, people don't want to hear about to the end. So he's like, I'm going to get in here with the kid song. Country kid song. Hit it everywhere. By the way, guys, hear who I am. Yeah. By the way, here's who I am. And here's a music video of me clapping ass cheeks on the devil. Here's me <laughs> and the, and the, making and shoes with out. blood in them. The album rollout of him very much pregnant. Yes, incredible. Oh my god! Just, that and what a, what a troll on Twitter too. I mean, yeah, he he's oh. came in with a fourth little Nas X came he's, in with Nas too. I mean, obviously this Montrose is his real name or whatever, but yeah. He's one of a kind, man. His Twitter presence and how he lives to just piss people off. Did I ever tell you my brother got a hold of one of the pairs of those shoes with the blood in the heel? What do you mean got a hold of them? Like he was one of, I think they like, I, I forget if they sold like 666 of them or if they leaned in that hard. Jake got one of the pairs and flipped them and made a couple thousand dollars, I think. Got the, the, the same Air Maxes? Yeah, they were actually kind of cold. <laughs> yeah, cold as blood. Yeah, I, he did. Ba See, what didn't get enough coverage is he balanced them out with an angel pack, too. Like, he had something for both sides there. It wasn't just the scale all tipped towards the Dark Lord, who, by the way, he killed in that music video. So he was actually fighting against Satan. 
Did he kill him? It feels like he probably would have killed him with his penis or something, though. Did he, how did he die? No, he like broke his neck in the music video. Okay. He went down there and he twerked on him a little bit and then he killed him. Now, I think then he put on the crown at the end, but the whole point is he defeated the Dark Lord, which I thought was the goal of this whole like endeavor. Did you guys hear that? Christian community, all the, all the religious people? I didn't watch it. Yeah, I can say Brandon clearly Never didn't watch it. it. I watched that thing multiple times, man. That was the, <laughs> if you if you also enjoy a good bit of Lil Nas X, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, review, leave us a five star rating, and tell Brandon what a phenomenal job he did. Brandon, let's get to this, that, and the third, and finish this thing off. Let's. We talked about it yesterday. Starting to happen here. According to sources telling ESPN's Adam Schefter and Brian Windhorse, uh, mm-hmm. multiple groups have now submitted fully funded $6 billion bids for the Washington Commanded, uh, fully financed bids, I should say. That includes the Josh Harris and Mitchell Rails group that also has Magic Johnson involved, submitted mm-hmm. a fully funded financial bid for the Washington Commanders that met the asking price Daniel Snyder had set forth of $6 billion. Now, this is the part that was also reported to Wendy, Canadian billionaire Steve... Uh, uh, Apostopolis has also submitted a fully funded six billion dollar offer for the commies, and if either bid is accepted, it would break the previous record for a sale set in August when that Walmart group bought the Denver Broncos for four point six five billion. So apparently, Tillman Fertitta, the Rockets, also interested in purchasing, and there's another group. So Brandon, it seems like we finally got the buyers after what seemed like a little bit of a tepid market early on. We finally got the buyers to get this dude out the paint. Not, we have the buyers, Mike, but I feel like the value is right where it's supposed to be. I, I know D.C. is like a whole DMV area, but it's a port city. Like, not to take it back to the old times. <laughs> it's like, Finally, we can get all our tea here. <laughs> it's straight from a water source, Mike. I just feel like that ups the, the price a little bit. So I'm just happy to see that a franchise that has performed poorly is valued properly based on its fan base, its region, its upside. I'm I'm liking where we're at. Well, I see, I always think that's generally a bad thing, though, because it incentivizes bad behavior. You don't need to be good at your job as an NFL owner to recoup huge financial gain from the organization being sold. And that's a sad reality for most people that are fans of teams, because as you sit there and might piss and moan about how shitty your owner stadium was like it was in Washington, or how mid your team has traditionally been like a team like the the Cincinnati Bengals, at the end of the day, when these guys sell to the highest bidder, they're going to break records every time because like the quarterback market there's only a few of these that exist there's 32 franchises in north america in this lucrative sport and so any opportunity to get in the billionaire boys club is a huge huge chance for any of these guys that actually can put the funds together and so if you're one of the people that owns it it really doesn't matter if your team sucks every year and you don't do right by your fan base you're still going to walk away with billions of dollars in your pocket and shit for daniel snyder who's been the worst defender of all of this who's created yeah. a toxic workplace who's had multiple investigations the constant like the win for us is he goes away he still gets to go away with potentially six billion dollars in his pocket because remember he bought out all the minority investors a while back so he owns pretty much all of this shit mike a lick is a lick a good investment is a good investment he came into that thing as richie rich he was like 30 something when he started owning the team It, it, it was going to pay out and he paid it he paid enough people to stay I don't want to get into that, Mike, but it's there is a, a real there's a reality to a high valuation to having someone go away. And this is oh, how much it costs. It's it's worth it for him to not be here, but it's a shitty consolation prize to know that after all of that mismanagement and all of the lives he affected negatively, he gets to ride off into the sunset with that. It's a reminder, being an owner in the NFL is a sweet, sweet gig. I pray Magic Johnson's group gets it just so we get Magic Johnson NFL tweets on a more consistent basis. Like two weeks Mm. after the fact, he's updating you on what the team did at the bye week. Magic Johnson's analysis of the commanders at the trade deadline would be famous. All of it would be perfect, and I pray we get more of it. Hey, he might bring back Magic Theaters and and put it in the stadium. I love a nice movie theater in in a football stadium. God, we can only hope. Uh, Brandon, let's get to that. (laughs) Speaking of things that actually... uh, got people to watch and for good reasons and performed incredibly well both on and off the court saw the news yesterday uh by the numbers and i saw this uh on the uh together x twitter account 
Um, I'm not sure where this came from before, but by the numbers, Sunday's matchup between the Iowa women's basketball team and Louisville women's basketball team had 2.499 million viewers. According to ESPN, that tournament game had more TV viewers than any NBA game ESPN has aired all season so far. Ooh. This game was also the highest rated and viewed broadcast on cable on Sunday. And Brandon, we already talked about it. We got the big one waiting in the wings when South Carolina and Iowa yes, decide yes, to square sir. up in this Final Four game. So an incredible testament. Certainly, we can talk about the NBA's regular season and what's gone awry with that as a product, but this continues to show the upward trajectory of women's basketball and especially women's college basketball when you put it on the big networks and actually give them the stage to shine on. Absolutely, Mike. And I just got done watching the McDonald's All-American game, women's game and the men's game. Women's game, obviously, a uh, co-MVP for the game. Uh, someone who is a Notre Dame signee, Hannah Hindal- H- Hindalgo. Anyway, scored 16, uh, 26 points. Uh, that game went over the century mark for both sides. The women's game, 110 wow. versus, uh, to 102. And I, I don't know. I just It was good to see even at that level, Mike, the high school level. Obviously, McDonald's All-American. You're looking at the best athletes in the sport. But the game was exciting. And I think we are all watching and consuming women's basketball different than we did, what, two, three, four, five years ago, last year? Well, and I, but I think it's like something that we all recognize. Like I always remember telling people as a player on Notre Dame's campus, they were one of the teams that was actually a legitimate contender every year. While we were trying right. to figure our shit out while you and I were there from 2008 to 2012 on the football side, we had women's soccer, men's lacrosse, and women's basketball and Notre Dame fencing. We were a fencing school. But women's basketball was a perennial Final Four team, was a perennial national championship contender, one two under Muffet McGraw. And we saw all the time with Skylar Diggins on campus, our friends like Devereaux Peters, Brittany Mallory. We had so many ladies that we saw a ball. We could go to those games all the time and understood and appreciated what they were bringing to the table and what they were bringing to the campus each and every night. We saw in that South Bend community how much that local community especially loved our yes. women's basketball team. And it's because they were great, they were accomplished, and it was something that the school supported there. And so now to see that on the national level, That support from television partners actually coming in and giving a stage, an equal stage that allows them to go out here and do this is something that I feel like a lot of us that got to live this when the women on these teams were our peers and these were people we got to see every day and appreciate. I always tell people how freaking cool that our women's basketball team, we get to go see a top five team play whenever we wanted and we get to root for them deep into March Madness almost every year. That was such a huge win. It it was the only way I could really understand how certain students saw us on campus or in in class like when we were sitting in our FTT class and Dev would come in with ice on her knees and Devro Peters and just uh just you know kind of just collapse and, and try to focus in on school I was like oh man Dev went off last night like she's here that's her right there like that's our friend That's what I always tell people. That was the most fun part of college to me was our friends because we'd be out there in summer school together. And just Mm -hmm. in general, your lives are so similar as athletes that it's cool to get to watch your friends on TV and watch them ball. And they did it on way bigger stages than we were consistently doing when it came to postseason play on the football side. So if we wanted to see someone with a chance to actually win trophies at that point and at that juncture before we got it rolling... It was them. So, I, you know, again, just a ton of respect for for all of that and glad to see it finally getting the numbers to shove in so many people's face who have argued in bad faith against that sport for a long time. Uh, I butchered a name before, and I wanted to clear it up. The Notre Dame signee that was the co-MVP of the McDonald's All-American game is Hannah Hidalgo. Hannah Hidalgo. There we go. A salute to Hannah. True baller. Uh, Brandon, let's get to the third uh, group of true ballers getting honored uh, in the uh, Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame class of 2023. How about this? Dwayne Wade, Dirk Nowitzki, Greg Popovich, Pau Gasol, Tony Parker, and Becky Hammond in this class. 
unbelievable. Obviously, Becky Hammond, as we talk about uh, women doing incredible things in the sport, the first coach in the WNBA to earn more than a million dollars in salary, uh, had also been a part of that Spurs organization for a number of years as a coach. But man, the rest of this, this happened with the Football Hall of Fame class recently, and now it's happening with hoops. It's all the people we grew up watching, man. It's, yep. It is humbling now because we're officially old. Like those NBA finals when you had LeBron and D. Wade laughing and snickering at Dirk and the Mavs and it coming back to bite them in the ass. Now we're going to get to watch them dap up and talk about that as they get enshrined. It's, it's oddly enough, it's like the first time we really get to learn about some basketball players. Yeah. Obviously, you can do your research, but the, these Hall of Fame speeches are so detailed who they have uh, bringing them to the table. Mike, I just saw a clip promoting the Hall of Fame uh, with Tony Parker showing his at home gym and he has like. It's lined with his basketball gym is lined with famous Marvel characters like Rant, like Groot, like the life size Hulk, like Batman. It's just like very odd and weird. Like I never think that Tony Parker was into this stuff. But hey, like this is the guy who started this or who was that was the point guard of this dynasty that we that we got a chance to see. Hey, big in the Marvel. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's cool to learn that stuff. You're right. The Hall of Fame speeches are such a great window into these people. Always love learning how great people got to where they were. Tony Parker, who had been one of the fastest players in the NBA for what felt like the entirety of his career in that backcourt with Manu Ginobili. Pau Gasol, who we saw just get celebrated with his jersey retirement in Los Angeles with the Lakers. Yeah. Obviously a big part of so much of that Lakers success in the second iteration alongside Kobe Bryant. And then like, Dirk. you know. Oh, I mean, Dirk, you know, the iconic shot that we saw immortalized in a statue that almost looked like it was going to be a really poorly made statue outside of the Mavericks Arena in Dallas yes. that they thankfully fixed, but, you know, has given way to. Dirk, you could look at as one of the most influential players as far as getting us to where we've got now, where we have stretch fives like Giannis Antetokounmpo in the game, Kevin Durant ball handling at almost seven feet tall as effectively as they do. Dirk was one of the guys on the forefront of that as far as great shooters at that height in the NBA. And that's what I love about them going in at the same time because it was the iron sharpens iron thing that happened that made both of them seem so great in our eyes over time. Like them, uh, obviously D Wade and Dirk getting a chance to battle against each other. And if you haven't heard a take from me yet that made you want to throw up, then this is the perfect time. After watching the McDonald's All American game, I think Bronny has a chance to get in the Hall of Fame if he becomes the t the two way player that he seems to be. He's he's a really good spot shooter and a very very good energetic defender. It's like. Uh, who's that guy who's always stealing stuff from the uh, stealing stuff, stealing balls from um, uh, the <laughs> the Pelicans? Uh, Altuve? It's not Altuve. <laughs> Wait, he's, he's just stealing, a high energy defender. Stealing stuff. He's, he's, he's stealing inbound passes a lot. I don't know. What oh my he, was, God. he got bit by Brand, uh, Brandon Ingram on the on the bench the other day. Oh my God. I, I will say, it, as that side note, Bronny James Jr. is someone who I think's trajectory has skyrocketed recently. He's done all the things you'd expect someone who's LeBron James' son to do in the intangibles and the neck up stuff and the way that he approaches yes. clearly improving himself physically. You see him get bigger, stronger, incredibly athletic every time you see him. So, yeah, he, he seems to be in good position there. So, he'll, I'm sure, be there with his dad supporting Dwayne Wade, obviously. The more and more I look sure. back on it, Probably my favorite era of basketball in my adult lifetime was the Heatles. Like it was really? just such a un it was such a unique time, man. Because people had so convinced themselves LeBron James was this terrible person for how he handled the decision. That was a team that won a lot, but still felt like it left some on the table. Think about that. We had a decision at a boys and girls club in Connecticut. We had a pep rally for those guys when they showed up. The not one, not two, not three, and then you had yeah. them actually go out there and kick the shit out of a lot of people after having to figure out how two best friends would go play together early on. We had the banana boat crew. I think come out of that era also like it was really an incredible time for basketball and you had Pete yeah. LeBron which is the coolest thing ever yeah I was gonna say but you're such a um a star uh beep like you're you're, all, you're always yeah you're always, I'm not I didn't say it you did but I'm saying like what about what about the, the Detroit Pistons dismantling the the Kobe and uh Shaq Lakers like what what about the the team basketball that was played with Tayshaun Prince, Rip Hamilton and and Ben Wallace, one of the best 
Bat, like, talking about people Hall of Famers, like one of the best defenders we got a chance to see undersized is at that with that fro. I just, you know, there's just so many other moments. Even the Spurs run, Mike, Greg Popovich talking about legends. Like, don't look at me. Timmy, Brandon. Big fundamentals. Brandon. That was an amazing time in basketball. And you were talking about the Heatles, the big. An amazing time in basketball. You probably couldn't even tell anyone what Parker, Ginobili, Tim Duncan, or Kawhi Leonard's voices sounded like over that stretch. We barely ever heard anyone on that team speak or do anything interesting over that long run. It was impressive. But Brandon, that other shit is fun. Like what Ben with the that Pistons team, awesome. Such a fun group. Ben Wallace is one of my favorite players to play in video games with every time, without Absolutely. question. But the heat stuff was just way more fun and the moments they gave us the ray allen shot that was part of that great comeback with all the heat fans banging on the outside everything that was around in that basketball think about in that era too you had because lebron james was getting penalized prime derrick rose before the injury downfall Mm. his 2011 Mm. mvp season those bulls teams with him and joe kim noah and all those guys like you had it was a fun era of basketball Okay, now now you're getting me to sway your way, and I now I'm interested in general the conversation of people's individual best or favorite eras of basketball because that's all so subjective and can lead to a bunch of conversations that go nowhere. Perfect for podcasting. At Gojo Show on Twitter. Tweet us your favorite era of basketball in the NBA. Uh, if you enjoyed this era of the podcast, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, and review. Leave us a five-star <laughs> rating. And check us out on the DraftKings YouTube channel under the Gojo with Michael at Junior tab. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Go, go. Boom. Money in the bank.